Hello friends, thank you for watching this video. I am Muhammad and I will be giving you today an introduction about Kubernetes. So what are we going to be covering today? First, we're going to be discussing life before containerization. Then we're going to be discussing container deployment. What is container orchestration? And then we're going to be delving in on what is Kubernetes? Why, why do we need to use it? Some of the benefits and then the architecture of it. Please like, share and subscribe if you like this video. It will really help the channel. So. A brief history tour. We're gonna first start discussing a single server deployment. So single server deployments are when we have all the application and services hosted on a single server, which means the server did not implement single responsibility. The server was jam-packed with everything from multiple application and services that it was running on. And that means there was not enough resources to handle for everything or resource management was a bit complicated to do. So let's say, for example, we had a mobile application, which was like taking up to 75% of um, the resources and the 25% which is left was distributed by the background services and the client. And there was no actual way that we could have allocate, for example, 40%, 40% and 30% because when, when it comes to single server deployment, we didn't have that level of control of what resources every single application will get. So this is one of the main disadvantages, which is resource allocation. And the second point, what it was very hard to scale. So let's say, for example, we had our mobile application had, for example, 5,000 users simultaneously, and then that went up to 10 to 15,000. If we want to like scale up the mobile application by itself, we could not have done that. What we needed to do is we needed to update that server hardware. For like, for example, we can update the RAM uh, from two gigabytes to like 12 gigabytes and update the SSD uh, or the hard drive from, for example, 50 gigabytes to 200 gigabytes in order for us to accommodate with this influx of users. But that means that the other services needed to be also updated, which we didn't really need to do that. And the second is, while we were updating the single server, what there could have been some downtime while we do all of the scalability. Another thing is management of that server. So let's say, for example, if we want to manage a single application and we want to manage how it's communicating with the different services, it was a bit complicated to do because uh, there was it wasn't really um, isolation of that application. So it was just open for everyone and it was much more easier for people to be able to access that application. But on the other hand, the single server deployment has some advantages. It was, it was easy to host. So we had one ser single server that we just threw everything on it and it was able to actually do all of the work. Uh, second, it was easy to maintain when it comes from the OS side. So let's say there was a security update that we need to do or an update on the server. So as soon as we updated that main server, all of the application benefited from that update. So that led us, uh, those disadvantages led us to the next evolution, which is virtualization deployment, VM deployment. So VM is virtual machine deployment. What does that mean? As a solution to a single server deployment, virtualization was introduced. It allowed us to run virtual machines on a single physical servers, where the CPU and the RAM were being shared across these different machines. Every application had its own virtual machine, which is gonna, which basically did the separation of concerns. So, for example, back to our previous example, we had the mobile application uh, now, which is, has a mobile client, which is basically handling its own mobile APIs on a separate VM. The client, uh, the web client was on a different VM and the background services were as well on different VM. And all of these VM were running on a single virtual uh, single server, which is basically uh, has the, all of the hardwares, uh, which are from RAM and SSD, and all of these hardwares were being shared across these different VMs. So this came with advantages and some disadvantages. What was the main advantages? Was uh, The first one was less downtime. So for example, uh, for any reason, the background server has crashed. The other two clients were still running normally because it was completely different instances. So crashing of one service did not mean that the rest is going to crash. While on the other hand, if for example, let's say the uh, background service is crashed and cost, for example, the IIS to stop, all of these other services would have stopped working. The second one is load balancing. So let's say, for example, the mobile client got an influx of users from 5,000 to 20,000 users, and we needed to cater for this. So instead of updating the resources for all of these machines, what we needed to do is just like 
upgrade the resource for a single machine. So we can upgrade the RAM, we can upgrade the CPU allocation, and we can upgrade the hard drive in order for us to handle the load better. And then when it comes to a resource allocation, so virtual virtualization will enable us to uh, dedicate as much resources as we want for every different service. So for example, let's say for the background service, we want to allocate only a gigabyte of RAM, or for example, the web client and mobile client, uh, we want to allocate, for example, uh, three gigabytes and three gigabytes. When it, comes when it comes to virtualization, we are able to do this. Because when we're creating a virtual machine, we are able to specify how much uh, memory, how much CPU uh, cores uh, every virtual machine gets and how much hard drives. But what what about the disadvantages that this implementation provides? So some of the disadvantages is very hard to manage. So right now we have a simple example, which we only have three uh, implementation, which is mobile, uh, client, uh, web client, and a background service. But what happens if you want to scale one of them to like a thousand computers and make them all run simultaneously? And then we need, for example, to manage all of this different uh, configuration for all of these. So this become very hard to manage. And then virtual machines have some uh, security risk, which is due to the virtualization process or the Hyper-V that they uh, use. And second is the hardware resources. So the more that we use of uh, resources, the more expensive the machine will get. So again, let's say we have 15 uh, virtual machine running on a single server and we want to allocate two gigabytes, for example, of RAM and a high number of CPU, uh, high CPU cores for every virtual machine. Those hardware requirements will become expensive very quickly. And even if we are using the clouds, uh, virtualization will also going to be costing a lot in order for us to cater for this demand. So where does this lead us? All of this leads us to something called container deployment. So the, the main difference between a container deployment and a virtual machine is the OS level. So here, for example, every one of these have a different OS. Uh, and that OS, by default, is like an added value of management that uh, we have on top of the original OS that the, those virtual machines are running on. And this by itself causes a lot of headache and uh, causes a lot of... Uh, load on the virtual machines itself so when it comes to container deployment we are using the main uh, the main machine the main os of that machine and then we are running containers on top of that so i have a different video which is basically goes down into the details of docker and containerization i will link it on the top right hand side here as well i will leave it in the description down below if you want to understand more about containerization and how docker uh, docker works and how uh, what's the difference between a virtual machine and a docker container uh, in that video i will go into detail about that but for now let's just assume that the containers are like a small uh, vms that that it's a lightweight vm that can be used instead of virtual machines and doesn't not require its own operating system so what is the main the main benefit of this? So the main benefit uh, of the container deployment is CI/CD, so continuous uh, integration and continuous deployment. So what does this mean? So for example, going back to the virtual machine virtualization example, here if we wanted for uh, to up to update the virtual machine, we needed to send like a an image of that virtual machine. We needed for it to wait uh, to build and then. And we need to need, we needed to initialize, and then after it has been initialized, it uh, it will be available for work. But when it comes to container management, all we needed to do is just pack our application into a single uh, container, and then just give it to the container management, and the container management will automatically swap those services without even the user noticing. So basically, it will take down uh, the old container and then automatically run the new container in order for us to avoid any uh, downtime as well as let's say we have another person who needed to have access to this content to this application but he didn't really need to get access to the source code all they needed to do is to have a single uh, version of that application which they are they wanted to run locally again they are able to take this uh, container and then they will be able to run it uh, better load handling. So what does that mean? When it, uh, because they are all container based. So for example, let's say if a single container is requesting a lot of, uh, has a lot of traffic coming through it, we don't really need to increase the resources for all of the other containers. 
the container will automatically communicate with the container management and the container management will automatically communicate with the kernel of the OS and then all of these resources will be automatically allocated to that uh, container in order for it to accept the load balancing and let's say for example that uh, load got a lot uh, different containers will start got initialized in order for us to in order for that container management or the actual container to be able to handle the load so for example instead of having one container we could have initiated five containers and those five containers will automatically handle the influx of uh, incoming requests so basically these are the main uh, benefits of container deployment we're going to be delving more in details of how they work right now we're just giving a quick overview so, but what uh, what's the disadvantage of having a container deployment? Uh, deployment. The first disadvantage is the uh, management of it. It requires a bit of a, a learning curve for us to uh, to be able first to understand how the container management work, uh, what is its structure, how how should we deploy it, uh, what are the main configuration. Second are the security risks. When the security risk of container deployment is uh, if we don't set it up correctly which can lead to a leaking of some information because as we're going to see when it comes to the structure of container deployment specifically with Kubernetes and how all of this information are stored uh, we need to make sure that the information that we store inside those cont uh, container deployment are stored in, a, in the right place so what is container orchestration? with docker we can run a single instance of an image with a docker run command so let's say here we have an image of our API and we want to run an instance of that API. We can use the docker run command in order for us to initialize that API. So what happened when the number of users increased in a single instance uh, and the single instance is not enough? Uh, one way for us to do this is to run the docker run command multiple times and that will lead to different instances running simultaneously which means as we can see here we have five instances for example running simultaneously on a single docker host because we have run the docker run command multiple times so that will lead us to different things the first thing is we need to keep an eye on what the, con uh, the containers which are running and the state of those containers so in case some one of them fails we need to reinitiate that container again by using the docker run command again and then for example if uh, one container become uh, not responsive we need to shut it down and then uh, we need to uh, reinitiate it or uh, rerun it again through the from the image so what is the benefit of this it's easy to manage it's easy to configure basically we are using the command prompt and the docker run command uh, cli in order for us to do all of these configuration and it's on management the hard part when it comes to this is having uh, to monitor all of these different inst instances simultaneously and make sure they are running in the best per, uh, in the best way possible another aspect is the health of the docker host so for example let's say the docker host which is responsible for running the uh, multiple instances has failed for any reason which means that all of the instances that are running they're gonna fail and basically it means that they're gonna be downtime in our application so the main reason uh, the main solution for that is either we need to find an engineer who will able to uh, fix the docker host for us or we are we need to some either like completely remove it or uh, uh, uninstall it and reinstall it again it's gonna be a cumbersome way for us to manage uh, a single docker host uh, if in, our, in a live running environment so this is where container orchestration come container orchestration is a solution that consists of a tool and script that allow us to host containers in a production environment so a container orchestration is basically different container instance multi, uh, different container instances which is running all simultaneously inside a cluster for example and those uh, instances are all running uh, the same version of our application so let's say one instance fails or, or a complete instance has failed not a single docker image as at the complete instance has failed we have for example three others which is are picking up the load so that way we don't have any downtime and another benefit of this let's say we need to scale up so we have right now for example in this example we have four instances running and let's say we and this was handling 10,000 users and all of a sudden right now we have uh, 20,000 users or 50,000 users to uh, on our application 
With container orchestration, we can scale up and down as we need to. So let's say those 50,000 users came directly to our application, we can just add more Docker host and multiple instances as we want until we are able to serve those 50,000 users. But once that traffic goes back to normal to 10,000, we can just remove all of the extra instances that we just created in order for us to uh, scale back down to the normal uh, level that we have before. As well, the container communication. So let's say we want container one to, to, uh, to speak with container two. When, when we have them inside a instance like that, it's very easy for us to create some custom networking rule in order for them to be able to communicate with each other. But when, if we want to implement this in a, a virtual machine, that will be really hard for us to do. Specifically, uh, we will not be able to have to do all of this directly from the CLI. It will have been much more complicated things and much more uh, time consuming to, uh, for us to do. While here with a single command within the CLI, we are able to scale up to 100 server, for example, and scale back down to 10 with a single uh, command or a single user input that we needed with a single command, basically. So what is container orchestration? Container orchestration is a solution that consists of tools and scripts that allow us to host containers in a production environment. It consists of multiple Docker hosts that can host a container. If one of them fails, the other one are still accessible. So for example, let's say here we have four hosts and let's say, for example, this one has failed. We still have another three, which is uh, accessible for the traffic. So which means in case one of the Docker host here fails, we don't really need to worry about it because uh, other hosts are able to pick up the traffic and there will be no downtime. The second is it allows us to deploy hundreds of containers in a single instance with a single command. So for example, let's say we had an influx of users from 10,000 to 50,000 and in order for us to accommodate this extra traffic, we need to have more instances running simultaneously and we want to scale up, for example, to 100 instances with a single command, we are able to scale up from four as we can see here to a hundred and then if we need to scale back down with a single with a single command as well we can scale back down from hundred to four another one uh, another benefit is scalability which means that uh, the resource allocation when it comes to scaling up and down is automatically managed for us by the container orchestration Another one is uh, the networking. So let's say, for example, we want container to be able to communicate with each other. We can set up some custom networking rule, which would have allowed us to make all of these uh, different instances communicate with each other. And the last and that one of the last benefits that we have as well from container orchestration is load balancing. So let's say, for example, uh, this instance here was having 5000 requests coming through it. Uh, the implement the load balancer inside the uh, container orchestration will automatically route all of the extra traffic that this instance is not able to handle to different instances and this has come out of the box we don't really need to do any extra work for uh, for us to do that so the load balancing will automatically be managed by the container orchestration so what is kubernetes kubernetes is an open source container orchestration platform for managing containerized workload and services like docker that's facilitate both declarative configuration and automation. We can script and automatically allocate resources to nodes inside Kubernetes environment. It allows the infrastructure to run much more eff effectively and efficiently. It takes care of scaling and uh, failover of our application and it provide deployment patterns and more. So Kubernetes basically is like the container orchestration that we have discussed before, and it's one of the uh, current implementation of a container orchestration. There is a different one in the market. For example, there is Docker Swarm, but Kubernetes is the most popular one and is supported by all of the clouds provider from Azure to uh, AWS to Google Cloud. And Kubernetes for short is called uh, Q8, Q8S. And the eight stand here is it's the number of letter between the K and the S. So for example, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we have eight letters between K and S. This is we say uh, K, K eight S instead of we can uh, writing, uh, instead of saying Kubernetes. Uh, so right now, uh, moving forward, we're just gonna refer to uh, uh, in the text, specifically in the slide, we're gonna be referring to Kubernetes as K eight S. So, why use Kubernetes? Kubernetes has been built to provide us with a reliable infrastructure. 
it's a tool that help us manage the containers that we have. It has a modular architecture which makes it easy to maintain and scale. It also gives us the ability to deploy and update our application at scale, which is the main reason that it was created. And all of this scalability uh, is done through the CLI and we can do a lot of the work that we need with a very uh, with a short amount of commands. As well, it will allow us to automate a lot, a lot of the work that we want to do with containers. So Kubernetes will allow us to remove the manual process that we do when hosting and managing containers. So what are the benefits of Kubernetes? First, workload scalability. Kubernetes is very efficient. New instances are being added and removed easily without any downtime. It handles all of the container scaling with ease. So it means that we, if we need to add a lot of uh, instances of our machine, of our uh, application, Kubernetes will be able to create them, manage the networking, manage the connections, create, do all of the load balancer uh, stuff, as well as handle uh, all of the networking traffic without us doing any interference. The Kubernetes framework will be able to do all of that. And this also falls with the high availability stuff. So it also helps with the scalability. So it's designed for deployment. What does that mean? So Kubernetes allow us to uh, separate the deployment process from testing to deployment to uh, development. So we're having different Kubernetes clusters and having different instances of those uh, clusters will, allow, will facilitate the deployment. As well, in general, Kubernetes is highly available. Uh, so it means that there's basically no downtime whatsoever when, when coming to running our application on Kubernetes. Service discovery and load balancing. So Kubernetes can expose container using DNS or IP addresses. So that means that we can connect to our container through DNS or within direct IP addresses. If there is a high traffic of load balancing, uh, is handling by Kubernetes cluster and the traffic is automatically routed uh, through those uh, different instances uh, without us interfering. So what does that mean? So let's say, for example, all of a sudden we had 50,000 users coming through our applications, instances directly being initiated with Kubernetes. Traffic is automatically routed to those new instances without cutting the traffic from the old ones. So let's say the old ones were handling 5,000 requests, any excess of those 5,000 requests, instead of being stuck in a queue for that uh, instance to handle it, it's automatically routed to the new instances and so we can provide better service or better uh, response time uh, for our application. Storage orchestration. So uh, that's a very interesting one because Kubernetes give us the ability to use local storage. So uh, if we have an SSD, we can use that SSD and we can basically store all of the information uh, that we want, uh, specifically if we are running uh, Kubernetes locally uh, or on-premise. But if we have Kubernetes running, on, for example, on Azure or on AWS, we can use the um, uh, cloud storage, for example. We can use blobs uh, that... Uh, um, as we provide and we can connect directly through that and through that way we are directly as well inheriting all of the security free features that the clouds provide us so that's a very good added value automated rollout and rollback so the desired state of containers can be described using kubernetes the actual state of a container changes to the desired state at the controlled rate so we can forward uh, roll forward or roll back easily so what does that mean? So in case, for example, we uh, send an update to our Kubernetes cluster and then the application is start running and then we discover that we don't really want to have that version out yet or we discovered some kind of a problem with that version. So we need we want to roll back to a previous state of our application. This is easily can be done with Kubernetes. So we can just like uh, add a command and from that point forward, uh, all of the new clusters will be revert back to the old instances without any downtime, of course. Automatic bin packing. So automatic bin packings mean that we can actually specify the compute power that we need when it comes to CPU and RAM for each container that we need. So that means that we can, similar to a virtual machine, we can allocate how much container, uh, how much each container can take uh, RAM, how much each container can take of the CPU, how much each container can contain of a storage of its on-premise. And from that point forward, we can actually uh, specify the resources that every container 
excuse me, it's allowed to take. And finally, Kubernetes is highly portable and 100% open source. So Kubernetes source code on GitHub is one of the most top rated source codes uh, on GitHub, which means that it's actively being uh, managed by the community and a lot of features has been added to them all the time. So this means that there is a long lifespan for Kubernetes and it's uh, in essence, it's still in its uh, early days. So there's a lot of new exciting features that's going to be added to it on the long run. The last two uh, benefits that we want to discuss when it comes to Kubernetes is secret management and self-healing environment. Let's start with a secret management. Kubernetes allow us to store and manage sensitive informa information such as, pa such, such as passwords, OAuth token, and SSS keys. You can actually deploy uh, all of these secrets and configuration without rebuilding the container. So, for example, we can we have a certain space within the uh, Kubernetes nodes uh, where we store all of this information, and we can add, update, and delete information from those from that place specifically without affecting the running container. And the running container will automatically fetch this information from that specific uh, place in the Kubernetes nodes in order to stay up to date. So that means that we're not going to have any downtime when it comes to uh, the container. Uh, when it's trying to read or, or uh, trying to access any kind of information. And finally, it's a self-healing environment. So that means that in case there is a container which is failing or there's a cluster which is failing, Kubernetes will detect that behavior and will automatically restart that process. Or uh, if it's actually not able to restart it, it will just kill it and then create a new container instead. So the, that's a really powerful tool that will allow us to have zero downtime and will provide the best uh, responsiveness to our application. Now let's jump a bit into the architecture of Kubernetes. So Kubernetes architecture consists of set of nodes. So what are nodes? Nodes are basically a node is a machine. It's a physical machine if we are running Kubernetes on-premise or it's a VM on which the Kubernetes software is set up. A node is a worker machine and it's where the containers will be launched by Kubernetes. So basically, it's like a virtual machine with a Kubernetes software installed on it and it's being managed by the main Kubernetes system. So why do we need more than one node in our Kubernetes cluster? Because what happens if one of our machine is running, uh, is running our container fails? We need another one to keep the application running and we, so we don't have any downtime. And this sets of different nodes running together, it's called a cluster. A cluster means that we have two or more nodes running simultaneously. Basically, it's a group of virtual machines. So now let's say we have all four or five nodes running together inside of, uh, inside of a cluster. Who is responsible for managing this cluster? Who is responsible for sending information, checking the logs, adding the configuration, uh, handling all of those failures? We need a next, uh, an extra node, which is going to be called the master node in order for it to manage all of these nodes. So for this, we have something called the master node. And the master node basically controls all of the activities uh, and the infrastructure of the other nodes. So it's like the main node that sends all of the information to the other nodes. The master node is a node with Kubernetes control plane component installed. The master uh, watches over the nodes in the cluster and it's responsible for actually orchestrating the containers and the worker nodes. Every master node has these items installed on it. A scheduler, a controller, a container runtime, a kubelet, ETCD and API server. So what does these mean? So let's start with the API server. The API server is a RESTful based infrastructure which, uh, sec uh, which is secure with every connection. It's the main tool that we use in order for us to communicate with the, cl uh, with the clusters and with the nodes. It has, implement it has different implementation of interfaces, so different tools and library will be able to communicate effectively. It interact with the worker nodes and provide them with the uh, required information. So basically, the API server is our main communication gateway that we use in order for us to first for, to communicate with the Kubernetes clusters from the CLI, as well as the main way that the master node will be able to communicate with all of the worker nodes that we have. And it's just, it, it is the main way as well that all of the information are shared between different nodes. 
The second point that we want to discuss is the ETCD. Basically, ETCD is a tool that allows us to store configuration and information within the master node. It's a distributed, real, reliable a key value store. It is where we store all of the main configuration, the SSH keys, all of the password that we want. And uh, basically, this ETCD uh, is available for all of the worker nodes. So all of the containers that are running within those worker nodes will be able to communicate with the master node and then communicate with the ETCD in order for them to get all of this information back. And it's only where and it's only accessible via the API server. So there is no other way that we are able to communicate with the ETCD other than the API server. The third uh, item that we want to discuss is the scheduler. The scheduler basically manages all of the activities that's happening within a cluster. It's a key component when it comes to Kubernetes cluster. It is responsible on handling the workload. It is responsible of handling the traffic. It's also utilized excuse me it's also track the utilization of workloads on a cluster so if it needs to create more containers it needs to remove some containers it do, basically it does all of the math on how much container should be running at the same time uh, how much traffic is coming through so it allocate different instances to in order to cater for this traffic uh, it's one of the main components uh, within a uh, master node Second, we have uh, third, sorry, fourth, we have the uh, controller manager. The controller manager is basically the daemon server and the brain behind the orchestration. It runs in continuous loops, gather different information uh, from different parts of uh, the clusters and the different nodes, and then it's responsible to provide this information for the API server. So basically, uh, it goes and it's to collect different information from all of the nodes, from all of the containers, uh, from all of the events that happen and then after it gathered all of these events is to provide them to the API server. It is also responsible for noticing and responding to node containers fails. So let's say there is uh, one container which is failing or one instance which is failing, the controller manager will be able to detect, oh, okay, there's one container which is failing and we need to initiate a new one or we need to shut this down forcibly and then create a new one so we don't have any downtime. As well, it's a component which is responsible on changing the desired state. So let's say, let's go back to our example. Uh, say we rolled uh, a new version of our application and then we decided there's some issue with it and we want to roll back. The, con uh, the controller manager is basically uh, responsible in order to uh, version all of these uh, co uh, container images and then running instances based on those container images without any downtime as well. Uh, container runtimes means that in our case right now we are using docker and basically the container right now means the docker uh, software for us to run those containers and finally what is a kubelet a kubelet is basically the agent which is uh, running on each uh, node in the cluster it is the agent which is responsible to making sure that the node are running as expected it's basically a software which run on every node it basically detects the health of the node it basically detects excuse me, the uh, uh, status of the node, if there's some, something which is failing, if there's something not going right, it's main responsibility to make sure that everything is running as expected. If not, it will communicate this information to the control manager and then it takes us up from there. So the, that was the master node. The uh, normal node or the worker node is basically component of the same component, but uh, here it's a much in a more simpler way. So instead of having the uh, container runtime, uh, after we specify the container runtime in the master node, it's automatically for, for an, on our side is gonna be Docker. So the Docker container runtime is initiated within the worker node. Every node, as we have discussed before, must have the kubelets and we have the Kubernetes proxies, which is the API, which is able to communicate with the uh, API uh, on the master nodes. Thank you very much for watching this video. This was a quick overview about Kubernetes and its main structure from a theoretical point of view and how everything fits together. In our next video, we'll be discussing how to set up Kubernetes locally and how we can initiate a local structure and deploy an application to Kubernetes. Thanks again for watching. Please share, like, and subscribe. If you have any questions, please leave them down in the comments down below. Have a good day.